five, six, seven, and eight. Being short and wanting to be a dancer. Turn one, two, and three, four, five, six, seven, hit eight. And everyone said, you're never going to make it in the dance world. One, two, three, hit four, lean five, hit seven, eight. I said, yes, I am, and I'm going to. <laughs> Abdul is accustomed to counting out her shortcomings. Too short, too squat, heavy legs. I don't have that ballerina skinny body. That's okay, because if she did look like every other dancer, chances are she might not be one of the most famous dancers and choreographers of her generation. The one thing that people said time and time again is that she's a mediocre singer. She's a great performer. She's a mediocre singer. And despite that criticism, three years ago, she did cut one of the most successful first albums ever and just recently edged out both Madonna and Janet Jackson as the public's favorite female entertainer. So in Paula Abdul's case, maybe it's not a bad thing the critics think her voice isn't so hot because nothing seems to guarantee this woman's success like predictions of failure. Something must have happened somewhere where you said, I'm the girl who can, um... I guess because I, I, I've always been told you, when, you, when I can't, I say, well, I'm going to prove I'm wrong. I can. But I've always been that way. I've always had dreams and desires to do things. And in high school, I was, I was voted most likely to succeed, which is pretty funny. And pretty insightful of her classmates at Van Nuys High, just over the hill from Hollywood. They clearly recognize the ambition and determination burning in this five foot one inch and a bit dynamo. You know, growing up, I was the kid that didn't really um, get into playing with Barbie dolls and into the stuffed animals. I was at a very early age really into watching musicals. My absolute favorite dancer is Gene Kelly because he had such wonderful, beautiful grace, but he also was so athletic, and I really modeled myself after him. I really, I really wanted to dance, sing, and act. I wanted to be on TV. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be Judy Garland and Shirley MacLaine and Liza Minnelli. <laughs> With hopes of Hollywood propelling her, Paula Abdul trained strenuously, but often her only audience was the studio mirror. There were dance instructors who swore casting agents would never see beyond her size and shape, and casting agents who proved the dance instructors right. I mean, the humiliation of lining up in a line and knowing that I can, I can dance and I can do that choreography, give me a chance, but being cut before I'm even a shot to even show them that I can dance because of my height or the way that I looked um, was rejection over and over again. She disguised her weaknesses by playing up her strengths and in the process developed a style all her own. Fast, athletic, gutsy, and street smart, but with the humor and grace of the old MGM performers who are still her idols. In Paula Abdul, tap meets rap. What, what I envisioned that I wanted to do was contemporary, to make, make old MGM contemporary and be a pop contemporary artist who brought back the flavor of the old musicals. Laker girl. Finally, when she was 19, the pros did take note. The quintessential Valley girl became a Los Angeles Laker girl and within months, their choreographer. Halftime at the forum took on a radical new look as chirpy cheerleaders became jazzy dancers. Even Laker fan Michael Jackson wanted to know who was responsible and promptly hired Abdul to choreograph music videos for him and his family. It's Janet, Miss Jackson, if you nasty. Do you remember the first day you worked as a Jackson? Yeah. I was a nervous wreck because I wanted to pretend that I knew everything I was doing. And I didn't know anything I was doing. And the brothers were great. They knew that I was a Laker girl and this was my first big break. And they gave it to me. In the age of MTV, Abdul seemed to perfect dance for the little screen and was hired by many of its biggest stars. Your work gets cut out a lot. 
what you have to do is you have to choreograph with that in mind and just make all, like, each second count. So, I mean, if they're going to catch a second, they see an arm throw or a head, that's going to be more effective than just walking around. Is there anything you're very aware of when you're choreographing for yourself, like a body part you don't want to show, a side of your face you do, a movement that you know you look especially good doing? Of course, there's tricks to everything. Well, what are they called? Well, <laughs> being short, I try to do um, movement that's long and angular to compensate for being five foot two. I'm on my tiptoes right now. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you're getting taller as the interview goes. So you're very aware of that. All the ballerinas that I looked up to were these five foot seven, five foot eight, five foot nine, five foot ten, long, lanky, lo legs up to here girls. And I was always the shorter dancer who was like this powerhouse. And I, and I had all the energy, and all, but I had to go out there and, and like be as the best I could be so that I would get noticed because you'd see him up here and then you'd see me down here. But dance was never the ultimate goal, just the first step. Paula Abdul was now ready to move into the limelight and sing. The problem was there weren't a lot of people clamoring to sign her up. You're very much labeled in the industry if you're an actor or an actress Gosh, don't try singing an album, or if you're a singer, don't, oh, you're going to go into the films? Oh, my God. Jeff Aroff, a director of Virgin Records, was one of the few who didn't scoff at the idea. And, you know, she, it's sort of like that Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland thing. She comes in, you say, you know, I can sing. And you kind of go, yeah? Well, let's put you in the studio and see how you can sing. And, you know, it comes back and you go, yeah, she can sing. You know, they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. They were Did you? Risk. I was hoping I knew what I got myself into. I didn't know it was going to be quite like this. It almost wasn't. The first two songs were duds. Then a phone call from a San Francisco radio station broke the news that her third song, Straight Up, was heading straight to the top of the charts. Straight up now. Forever Your Girl sold over 10 million copies almost unheard of for a first album. Oh, my God, I'll never forget when I heard that, oh, my God, I think you have a hit. I think, really? Swift and slot and a plane and cool with my homegirl, Paul Abdul. Baby, seems we never, ever agree. America's youth was hooked instantly, but one of Paula's first acts was a tribute to an old-timer named Gene Kelly. We come together Suddenly, there was nothing poor about this little rich girl. She gave her mother the house she'd been living in, then paid almost $3 million to buy this one for herself. <laughs> Paul Abdul had made it. When I found out that the house is yours, I came here, an empty house. I sat in this room, and I just sat on the floor crying. I couldn't believe that this is my house. I have worked hard, and it's paid off, and I have this beautiful house. Hold it. At 28, Paul Abdul could be resting on her laurels, but that would go against her nature. For the past year, she spent almost every afternoon with vocal coach Gary Katona, strengthening her voice in hopes of silencing her critics. When critics said that with the first album, she has a mediocre voice, or she is a video star, or she's highly produced, did that bother you? A little. Mm -hmm. It did because, you know, I don't profess to be this incredible singer, but I think I'm a good singer and I think I'm a great performer. But while oh, Abdul's Abdul. working hard to cool the critics, she's discovering Abdul. just how hot life in the limelight can get. There's a recent unauthorized biography about Michael Jackson that alleges that Abdul's relationship with one of Jackson's married brothers was anything but businesslike. There's also a very public lawsuit against Abdul's record label, filed by a backup singer on her first album. I sing the lead vocals on every single song of the Forever Your Girl album. The singer is claiming her vocals were more lead than backup, giving Abdul a taste of the downside of fame. Why do you think 
all of a sudden you've become a target, that someone levels a lawsuit against you or someone writes really hurtful things. You know, it's really weird. I, I, know, I kind of make this assessment that when, you, when I was climbing to the top, there are, people, there are people that root for you, and then there's people that, you know, really don't care. Then when you get to the top for that one moment, it's like, ta-da! And then it's all the people trying to pull you down. And it just, it's weird how it is like that, but it is. I mean, you, get, you achieve a certain level of success, and then it's then keeping your head on straight. Album, Spellbound, Abdul is hoping to focus attention back on what she's always done well, her ability to conquer new turf. Uh, I'm kind of excited that I'm releasing a ballad first because then again it, it shows growth, it shows a new side of Paula, and I think it will also bring in new fans, new demographics, and, and just different people who really don't know a lot about my music. You give love, you get love, and more than heaven knows. The album is slower, partially to showcase Abdul's stronger voice. But while it may be different musically, she's hoping it will continue the tradition of selling across racial lines. Baby, push, push, hurry, hurry, Paula's mother is a Jewish-French-Canadian. Her father is part Syrian and part Brazilian. Her exotic ethnic makeup has led almost every racial group to claim her as one of their own. People don't know what I am. They don't know. I'm like, I'm this mutt, they think. But it's funny. I think it has worked to my advantage because I don't think I've alienated anyone. It's like a melting pot for me. I'm just Paula, you know, French-Canadian, Syrian-Brazilian girl. Mutt. Mutt.